This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Welcome to the Institute of Historical Research. And this is the second in our one a month, six seminars. Uh, we we're inviting a panel of distinguished historians to discuss some of the issues raised today by the way we regard the past. It's something appropriate, I was preparing my comments this morning and I was thinking it's quite appropriate, quite moving in a way that we're holding this seminar on Armistice Day. We're calling the whole project History Now and Then. And today's seminar is about what we think of as our heritage. Many of you I recognize were here a month ago at the opening seminar. <coughs> You'll remember that the director of the IHR, um, uh, Lawrence Golden, was here to introduce that seminar and indeed the whole series. And Lawrence was planning to be here for all six of them, but he's had to be whisked off at short notice to the United States. And lots of, lots of seats are in the front, if you like. Um, he's, been, he's had to go off to the States for a few days and he sends his regards, and um, I'm sure he'll be here when we meet again next month. If you were here a month ago, you'll remember that the opening seminar dealt with what seemed quite an interesting paradox. On the one hand, huge amount of interest today in history, books, television, films, heritage visits, family history, and so on. It's a very popular subject. And yet, at the same time, we felt that we were living in a culture that seemed to be extraordinarily present-oriented. And so we debated that, and one of the things that came up once or twice towards the end of the question session last time was the whole question of what we mean by heritage, which is the focus of today's, uh, today's uh, seminar. In some ways, of course, there's nothing particularly new about an interest in our legacy or in history uh, or, or in retaining our past. Um, there have always been people concerned to retain the legacy of the past, the great buildings and so on. And uh, not only, of course, in this country, patrimoine, talk to the French. Prosper Mérimé, whom you probably, if you know about him at all, you know about him as the author of Carmen. That was his day job, looking after the... the, the you know, and Viollet le Duc, who was a protégé of his in Paris at that time. And that's in the... I'm talking 1830s, 1840s. Uh, National Trust was created in this country towards the end, I was going to say of the last century, towards the end of the century before last, in the 1890s. So there's nothing completely new about this interest, but it seems to me, and we'll hear the panel on this in a few moments, that our interest in heritage, our reverence, for, you know, heritage with a capital H, is something fairly recent. It's grown in recent decades in various ways. Maybe because of a fear of the physical heritage being, being lost. Not just the bombing of the war, but subsequently. Some of you will remember, as I do, when um, the neoclassical um, arch of Euston Station was demolished in the early 1960s. Nearby St. Pancras, neo-Gothic, was nearly demolished shortly after that, and only was just rescued at the last moment, as it were. Everybody, I think, now believes it important to retain our heritage, the great buildings and so on. English heritage was set up in 1983, I think I'm right in saying. And no one could quarrel with the importance of heritage. But it does raise many questions, more perhaps in the way that heritage is done than the fact that we all think it's a very important thing. There have been critics. Um, Patrick Wright, for example. Um, lots of seats in the front. Do come and join us up here. I won't pick on you especially for the question. <laughs> um, Patrick Wright uh, argued that, hi uh, that history was in danger of becoming enwrapped in quaintness, antiquarianism, that a kind of sanitized narrative of national history was being harnessed, perhaps for basically political purposes. David Canadine, former director here of the IHR, worried uh, that a kind of national heritage idea could encourage what he dubbed the picture postcard, a pretty picture of our history. You know, the argument that maybe we put beauty 
the beauty of something ahead of the historic value of it occasionally. Robert Hewison, from whom we will hear shortly, there he is, um, wrote a very powerful book, maybe 20 years ago, I think, Robert, now called The Heritage Industry, Britain in a Climate of Decline. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lively lot. They'll get their turn in a moment. Um, you may, you may re I, I remember enjoying and slightly shocked by a rather witty Alan Bennett play at the National Theatre two or three years ago called People, where these sort of two old ladies realised they were in a grandiose house in the National Trust, or was it English Heritage? National Trust. Came over and tried to beautify and bring in lots and lots of people and almost turned it from a home into an art gallery. So these are the kind of issues that will probably be raised. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to talk for about 10 minutes. And then after that, we'll invite questions from the floor. And my intention, just before 10 past 6 now, certainly by about 7-ish, there'll be questions from you. By half past 7, let's wrap up. The drinks are already waiting over there. Come and have a drink, chat to us all individually. Um, and then a little bit past eight, ten past eight or so, I'm going to whisk these people who have really earned it by then off to a nearby restaurant for dinner. So let me introduce them to you. I'll say a word or two about each. And so as not to offend anybody, I thought I'd go in alphabetical order. First thing I should tell you is that if you came here having seen the cast originally advertised. Jonathan Glancy, the, the uh, architectural expert, is not able to be with us for personal reasons, but I'm very glad that uh, Roger Bowdler has been able to take his place, and I'm very grateful to Roger for doing so. Roger is, uh, by training an art historian, he's always had a particular interest in, in all the gloomy things that you find in churchyards, tombs, mausolea, and the like. Um, but in addition to all the grisly stuff, which he is very expert on and I have learnt from him, uh, he's written about a great deal else. He's written about uh, John Everett Millet. Am I right that you're descended from Millet? Or is there some connection there somewhere? somewhere? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, thought, okay, I thought there might be. Good. Millet hated Ruskin, and as we're here, the gentleman next to him has written about Ruskin, so I'm hoping that will be closed. Um, <laughs> Roger joined English Heritage in 1989. Today he's Director of Listing at Historic England, which I think uh, Roger means you're responsible for advising government on all heritage designations, listed buildings, archaeological sites, and, and so on. Robert Hewison next to him, who wrote the book about uh, the heritage industry. I've known Robert 25, 30 years or so. When, when I first met him, he was already well known for his work on John Ruskin and also for books about literature and the arts in Britain, especially from Second World War, as it were, on towards the present. In the many years since, Robert, you've continued to be very highly productive, written more about Ruskin, uh, a recent book uh, in which you revisit the great expectations for the arts in Blairite Britain, just around the turn of the millennium, the great hopes that they were all talking about, about a much heralded golden age of culture and the arts, which perhaps never really materialized. But for our purposes this evening, I think it's the heritage industry and all that, is a, that relates to that that we'll hear from, from you in a little while. In a while. Uh, Maria Misra brings an international perspective to the evening seminar. She's an Oxford historian, she's at uh, Keeble, and her work has concentrated on the history of the British Empire and more particularly India, whose interestingly controversial Prime Minister, I think, is either here or about to arrive. Um, historians of India, I speak from total ignorance, but my impression is that they've either tended to talk about uh, the subcontinent aspiring towards something like the values of Western liberal democratic society, or perhaps more recent historians of India uh, emphasizing the long-term perhaps suffering from the effects of imperial exploitation. In your book uh, that I've been reading, Maria, Vishnu's crowded temple, she's emphasizing the sheer diversity of the legacy of Indian history. 
the religions, the caste, the regionality, the, and so, the languages, and so on. Anybody who's been to India and traveled around it will realize the generalizations very often don't just follow. How anybody can summarize the, the heritage of Indian history and what Indians feel about it today in 10 minutes, I don't know. But if anybody can, I hope Maria will, will be able to. No problem. That's what, that's what I like to hear. Alphabetical order. Simon Thurley, um, I've also known for many, many years. Uh, when I first knew Simon, um, he was, uh, had just been appointed, I think, curator of the historic royal palaces, went on to direct the uh, Museum of London. From there, Simon, you went on to be in charge of English heritage for, I think, 12, 13 years until earlier this year when it administratively changed in various ways. He's a frequent broadcaster and lecturer. Um, author of important historical books on the royal palaces of Tudor England, more particularly uh, Whitehall Palace, Hampton Court, most recently a book, Men from the Ministry, uh, in which you outline the way a small government department set about to save England's historic heritage, and another in which you place the history of architecture in England in its broadest social, economic, and political context. Amazing range of achievements among our panel. Enough from me. Let's start with Roger, Roger Bowdler. So tell us something, Roger, about the importance of heritage and its sometimes controversial links to what we think of as history. I won't give you the mic, but remember you're talking to the people in the far corner over there somewhere. <laughs> It'll be you, man. Over to Roger. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, I hope Jonathan Glantz is OK. Um, Sure he is. It is uh, an act to follow. Okay, I'm the first person that could do real privilege. The field is bare before me. We've already paid homage, fitting homage, again, second homage there. Very, you know how much books are valued these days, because they're available on eBay. Staggering sums of money. So this goes straight back to the library, and no one's going to have it. <laughs> now things have come a long, long way since Robert's imported 1987 book, the heritage industry, Britain in a climate of decline. And as a result, all of us, especially in our area of business, are really vigilant about the coarse, marketing-led promotion of the past as an escapist fantasy, a subset of the leisure industry that that book invited us to examine. But the question I'm going to invite right at the beginning is, of course, then who's going to pay for it? So, Simon. <coughs> Simon will be coming on to that. I don't want to talk about the presentation of heritage properties. That's, that's not for me to do. Um, Simon is profoundly expert in that area. We'll hear from him later on. What I want to look at is the wider perception of heritage, what's very unglamorously called, in the jargony term, the historic environment. And I'd like to talk a bit about 21st century aspects of that. But I'm also going to do a bad thing, to talk about what I do. Because I slightly feel at the moment we do need to explain what we're about as historic England. So that's what I'm going to be talking about now. I've worked for this organisation that was only hatched at midnight on the 31st of March, 2015. Our chairman makes the joke slightly too often about you can't start an organisation April Fool's Day. So we go for the midnight on March the 31st. <laughs> it used to be called English Heritage. And since then, I've worked for another one, Historic England. The change was well received amongst my colleagues. And for those who aren't familiar, Historic England is the, the government's advisor on the historic environment, sponsored by the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, to tune about £90 million. We recommend which buildings should be listed, which landscape should be registered, which archaeological sites should be scheduled, and which shipwrecks protected. All very confusing in our world. Um, which one should get official protection? Um, and I'm relieved to say the DCMS agrees with 99.8% of the recommendations we put to them. Let's not talk about Hyde Park yeah. works quite yet. Um, we need a drink for that one. Um, we also advise them on policy. We give advice to local authorities about planning cases. Um, we give out a dwindling sum of repair grants alongside the Heritage Lottery Fund with pretty small players these days. Um, we also write books and publish them and uh, pay particular tribute to my friend and colleague Elaine Harwood, whose great big book, a real leg breaker of a book, 
um, has just been published about post-war um, post buildings. Profoundly impressive it is too. So we give out, we do quite a lot, the range is wide, and you could say that what we do is the interface between history and the planning system. So we shed the H word, the heritage word, and that was a word that not everyone was comfy with anyway. Now, one of my responsibilities is, is looking after listing. I think it, uh, some words about that, because that really is the sharp end of putting history to work and making a difference on people's property. Listing, as um, Daniel was saying, was rehatched in the 1940s as a way of managing the rebuilding of blitzed cities. What could go, what should remain. That's really its genesis. And from the outset, it traded in two currencies. Architectural special interest, which really means anything visual, could be sculpture, um, and historic special interest, the two currencies of trade. And it was always more Pevsner than Betjeman in its approach, more interested in fabric than in the historic associations of a building. And it was really, really opposed to what you might call the Arthur Mee vision, the, the King's England approach, all very stirring and nostalgic. <coughs> It was much more applied and do with real buildings than, than was that. Listing steadily became much more about fabric and plan form, and earnest architectural historical concepts like that. Some older listings did include historic buildings of note for their associations. So I wonder how many of you have been to the site of the Cato Street Conspiracy, just parallel to the Edgware Road. It is indeed a listed building, has been for some time. But generally, historical associations were much more honoured with plaques, and that used to be the preferred approach. Did they have to be listed? And that's actually something we've moved away from, because in our view, um, placing importance on the material surroundings of the past, place where history has indeed happened, is, is really something rather profoundly special. And what we do can make a clear difference to the survival or otherwise of buildings. Half a mile north of here, is the Unison Trades Union headquarters. Now that occupies the former building housing the Elizabeth Garrett Anderson Hospital. And it was because that got listed, quite simply, that it's still there. That was earmarked to come down. So it can make a really strong difference. Designed 1890 by J.M. Bryden um, of, of Whitehall fame. Um, not the most marvelous example of Queen Anne buildings, but that connection with a place of medicine where women doctors could practice for the first time in the world, really profoundly important. So that flagging up the special interest for this too, is, is, we think matters. Now things have moved on a lot, I would suggest, suggest since the 1987 debate that, that Robert um, launched with great effect. And two things for me really stand out. Were, were you to do a, a, a new edition, I think a couple of the things that would need addressing, I suggest, are, are these. One of them is <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not going to call you grandmothers, I'm not going to suck any eggs, but there is a, a, a massively condescending moment in this talk, and we're just going through it now. <laughs> <laughs> the two things that you've really got to address, and I know that are in your speech, are about climate change, the idea of keeping the old, um, the, 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 the ecological economics of <coughs> retention. And the other one is globalisation, is that danger of sameness creeping over the land, the, and the interest in the distinct. That's something that I'd like to talk on a bit now. Now, the arguments about embodied energy go back and forth, to and fro. Some say that leaky old buildings are terribly wasteful, and clearly their replacement would offset the carbon outlay in building them anew. I think the um, others, uh, and I would say the majority now, aren't of that opinion. The idea that the embodied energy of the whole, of, of the old, should be retained. And there's an extra validity, uh, uh, the economics of, of ecology, if you like, that justifies retention and really drives home the sheer wastefulness, the, 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 the profligate squandering of old building stock. And that's an argument I think has come since 1987. And I don't think it's an argument that's been won yet, but I think more work is needed. But I think it's very helpful for those who respect the past. So that's one argument in favor of heritage. The other is about identity. And this concept, which is normally lambasted as nostalgia by its foes, this um, concept stresses the positive contributions of character, of a sense of place, of distinctiveness. 
Globalization seems, sees the steady crunch, crunch erosion of those very qualities. Historic associations add a level of interest, and the careful preservation of authentic fabric ensures that the stories such places contain can go on speaking to future generations in a place that marks them out as it's there, it's London, it's Bermondsey, it's that street. A level of detail, of authenticity of a place. Now, concepts of heritage have got to evolve all of the time. And one of the challenges we face is to ensure that capturing the stories of the 21st century, um, the, the 21st century audience, we're getting the stories they want to be hearing. London is fast changing, um, one of the great diverse cities of the world. So just a couple of, of, of instances from the sort of work I do that I hope talk about how we're altering. Um, Brixton Market faced a very uncertain future four years ago. Um, people wanted it pit down. And it's now throbbing. Um, listing helped, that, helped it ensure its market character. And it wasn't listed as a masterpiece of 1920s retail architecture. Oh, no. Um, it was listed because of the community value placed on it by the West Indian community on its arrival from the, from, from the 50s onwards. It was their meeting place. And another South London example, the listing this summer, very recent listing, of the Royal Vauxhall Tavern. Um, listed as the first building to be protected for its significance as a gay meeting and entertainment place. Earlier this summer, New York listed Stonewall Cafe, which is our, our homage to that, 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 that history, if you will. <laughs> now, one of the risks of heritage, it can be a bit uncritical, a bit cosy, a bit stereotypical. Let me end by challenging. Retaining the fabric of the past is not a blanket acceptance of the values of the past. The idea of heritage places as triggers for thought is really embedded in conservation philosophy now. To admire the Grand and May match factory in Bow isn't to condone appalling working <coughs> conditions, but to remember them. To care for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office as a building isn't to genuflect for imperialism, but to be invited to think about its impact. Now, English heritage, nearly there, English heritage overcame the reservation about the H word and got on with its pressing business of understanding and protecting the best of the past. Historic England is already using its renaming as a way of boosting its relevance. There's nothing particularly cutesy or oldie worldy about planning inquiries or heated discussions about multi-million pound sites being considered for this thing. I don't think the heritage sector is going to find a need to name for itself, but I do think the replacement of historic as a title signifier is a really welcome closing of a decades old debate. <laughs> Robert Hughes. Uh, it's the first time in my life when someone else has advertised my book. <laughs> Good, because I haven't got a copy. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Roger. Thank you actually for um, reminding people of that book, because I thought the reason I'm here is because of that book. <clears throat> that is a long time ago, and thank you very much indeed for, for inviting me to speak. Now I've had more than a couple of decades to think about this, um, I think that it was not so much my use of the word heritage in the title of the book that caused a certain amount of controversy more than a quarter of a century ago, as my coupling of the heritage with the other word in the title, industry. Because while heritage has reassuring associations with the idea of inherited property, industry implies that we are dealing with a manufactured commodity. At the time I read the book, and it came out in 1987, I was not, in fact, thinking particularly historically. As my deliberately provocative subtitle, Britain in a Climate of Decline, suggested, I was trying to describe a contemporary phenomenon, a turn to the past that manifested itself in a number of very interesting ways. This was a time when a new museum in Britain was opening every fortnight. When membership of the National Trust was burgeoning. 
when railway preservation societies were flourishing and regiments of historical reenactment groups were on the march. The word heritage had also entered the official policy discourse with the National Heritage Acts that established the National Heritage Memorial Fund in 1980 and English Heritage in 1983. This was a time, I observed, when things were no longer sold because they were new, but because they could be associated with the old, as in the case of up and over heritage garage doors. <laughs> One completely new phenomenon, unknown before 1975, was the heritage centre. This was a repurposed, redundant church or abandoned industrial building that didn't really depend on the display of material objects, as in an orthodox museum, but offered some kind of experience of the past, and often a past that was just out of reach of personal recollection. I took as my exemplar the Wigan Pier Heritage Centre, which had opened in 1986 in the semi-derelict quarter of Wigan, supported by a host of investors to the tune of three and a half million pounds from the European community down to the local authority. Now this seemed to me to be a desperate attempt to revive a failing economy by piling myth on myth. There never was a Wigan Pier, except in a song by George Formby Sr. and the title of a book by George Orwell. The historical representations, uh, which I remember included a coal mine, which for health and safety reasons was had a roof that was high enough even for George Orwell to be able to stand up in it, <laughs> sought to evoke the way we were. But by and large, in my view, this was the way we weren't. My argument was not just that history was being turned into a commodity and that the past was being summoned up as a salve to cure the ills of an alien present. It was that the heritage industry was essentially entropic, and that by putting our efforts into improving the past, we were making the task of progressing the present even harder. Uh, to that extent, I do think the word managed to put the word heritage into inverted commas, into scare quotes, if you like, so that people did think more carefully about what the heritage industry was actually doing, and what the word meant. What the book failed to do completely, I now see, was to argue sufficiently strongly that the past was being used for more than economic and consolatory reasons. I have not fully appreciated the extent to which the turn to the past was camouflaging a revolution in the present. In the 1980s, Mrs. Thatcher's conservatism, her ardent nationalism, and her resurrection of a very carefully selected set of Victorian values gave heritage the appearance of being an appeal to tradition of the revival and reinforcement of historic virtues. In fact, she was tearing the place apart. It wasn't just that traditional manufacturing was taking a bashing and the post-war consensus was being destroyed. Every source of independent and potentially differing opinion in civil society, not just the unions, but local government, the universities, the arts, the BBC, the church, was regarded as an establishment to be challenged and undermined. It's been pointed out that even the Tory grandees 
the patrician promoters of the cult of the country house lost their influence, though they did not lose their country houses. <laughs> My argument was and is that heritage is not history. Yes, history is open to the same criticism as its heritage in relation to its elusive subject, the past. Imperfect knowledge, partial points of view, slanted interpretation, class and gender bias, and a relativism born of the contemporary context all undermine the historian's claim to be telling the truth. The past is always seen through the distorting lens of the present. Yet historians do aim for objectivity even if they fall short of achieving it. The heritage industry, on the other hand, sets out not to probe and analyze, but to pacify the past, to bring the conflicts and crimes that have had so many victims into some grand and sentimental reconciliation with the victors, the victors who then become the authors of their and their victims' history. Wigan Pier shut down in 2007. Ironically, one of the reasons given was that the competition from museums that did not charge for entry uh, had made it impossible for them to be economically viable. So, the area was rebranded as the Wigan Pier Cultural Quarter. <laughs> the heritage industry had been replaced by another chimera, the creative industries. Commodification of culture, it seems, is always with us. Thank you. <laughs>
And this reflected the tastes of classically educated British officials for the antique, and particularly for Buddhist sites, which were especially revered. Under the tutelage, then, of heritage maniac Lord Curzon at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, the Rajit grid was expanded to include the great monuments of the 16th and 17th century Mughal Empire, a Muslim empire, as it happens. Curzon admired the elegant austerity of Mughal architecture. The Taj, for example, uh, was on the receiving end of his not altogether positive attentions. But the Mughals were imperialist tea judged almost as aesthetically refined as the British. With independence, then, the architectural survey continued the British tradition of focusing on the ancient and classical past, especially on Buddhist and Mughal monuments, but now supplemented by excavations of the Harappan sites of the 3rd millennium BC, which have been recently discovered. This, this focus chimed very much with the first Prime Minister of Independent India, Nehru's approach, which was to rather downplay Hindu cultural heritage and to focus on moments in India's cultural history which he judged to be particularly integrative and tolerant. Remember, India is made up of lots of different <coughs> religious groups, such as the Buddhist Ashokan Empire of the second century BC and the early Mughal Empire of Akbar, who was coterminous with Elizabeth I. The first sign, then, of a civil society engagement with heritage in India came in the 1980s with the creation of INTAC, the Indian National Trust for Arts and Cultural Heritage, in 1984. This was based on private membership, and it now has around 130 chapters in India, and it champions the preservation of monuments not covered by the ASI or by regional states. It has diverse interests, but it's closely involved and has been widely criticised for defending Raj-era buildings. So why do we find this shift in the 1980s? is some interest uh, in heritage beyond the government. I think two things are going on there. The first is the emergence of a, a new kind of middle class, a consumerist middle class with an interest in new kinds of leisure. So that's the first. The second is the dramatic rise of identity politics in India, and particularly the so-called drive for Hindu-ness, Hindutva. Uh, and and uh, Modi, the Prime Minister who is visiting at the moment, was very, very much at the centre of that. The first trend, then, the, the, the rise of a, a consumerist middle class, began largely among elite westernised upper middle classes in big cities like Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata, Calcutta, and Bangalore, and it was spurred by threats to conspicuous symbols of the Raj's heritage, such as the uncontrolled demolition uh, and redevelopment of part of Edward Luttian's New Delhi, or attempts to redevelop a Raj era public park in Bangalore, uh, where rallies to preserve it took place around a famous statue of Queen Victoria. They were opposing a more commercially minded and generally less westernised middle class who were indifferent and in fact sometimes hostile to Raj and Mughal era buildings and saw them instead as prime sites for commercial redevelopment going to waste as India's great cities began to boom. The second trend, the rise of identity politics, saw the issue of monuments and the preservation of monuments and control of public space become intensely politicised. The most notorious example of this, of course, was the carefully planned BJP, the Hindu Nationalist Party that Modi represents, carefully planned mobilisation against a 16th century Mughal era mosque, known as the Babri Mosque, uh, in the Indian city of Ayodhya, supposedly built, Hindus claimed, on the, mythic, on the birthplace of the mythic god Ram. This mobilisation culminated in December 1992 in 150,000 self-styled Hindu pilgrims converging on the mosque and demolishing it brick by brick with their bare hands. This was followed by riots across the whole of India that killed over a thousand people and a retaliatory burning of 250 temples in the neighbouring states of Pakistan and Bangladesh. At play was an odd mixture of, I suppose, what might be called the politics of hurt feeling and aggressive cultural assertion, in particular, a determination to assert control over public space. 
It reflected a sense among the anxious, less elite groups of Hindus that their culture was not respected, while Muslim and Raj culture was. In fact, it was being cosseted. And so, they were going to insist on the dominance of Hindu culture by violent de demolitions, if necessary. And subsequently, threats were issued against, for example, the Taj Mahal uh, and various Raj era monuments, including the Mutiny Memorial on the Delhi Bridge. More recently, this kind of aggression towards the, the Raj has subsided somewhat, as the Hindu middle class itself has grown and developed an appetite for heritage, especially the Raj heritage, albeit in a rather kitschified form. This ranges from lavish restorations of Raj era hotels for weddings, the emergence of a kind of postmodern extravaganzas like coronation, the Coronation Park themed leisure facility on the fringe of North Delhi, where Indian tourists can mingle with a jumble of Raj era statues and various vice, of various viceroys and kings which have been uprooted from their original homes in central Delhi. There's something very similar in Mumbai. To a very serious will to emulate Raj lifestyles among the new BJP elite who now join and pay for the upkeep and restoration of Raj era clubs like the Jim Karna Club in Delhi. And also, of course, send their sons, not their daughters, their sons, to the Eton mimicking Dune School in the Himalayan foothills. So this more broad-based elite support for the British Raj architecture and heritage now, of course, raises issues in India of social justice. For example, lots of Luttians bungalows, beautiful though they are, occupy huge amounts of land. They're set in enormous gardens. Uh, and heritage has really, in some ways, become a way of protecting very elite lifestyles against more democratic developments. So how similar, then, is this trajectory from that to that of Britain's own heritage industry? Probably the first aspect, still more, that the, that the consuming middle class is much more important here than it is in India. Britain is still a much richer society. The apple of middle classes make up a far greater proportion of the population than they do in India. They're interested in the past and in aestheticised environments. In India, these are still almost exclusively upper middle class pursuits, though they have broadened beyond the purely anglicised upper middle classes. And also, unlike India, heritage tastes in Britain, as we've heard, are changing. They're developing from the country house obsession to embrace brutalist car parks uh, and the tasteful redevelopment of the industrial past, such as, as that at King's Cross. Although, of course, it may be a sign that a similar thing is beginning to happen in India, that Lord Corbusier's modernist masterpiece, the 1950s new city of Chandigarh, is top of India's new list of nominated UNESCO sites. However, I think we might be able to detect signs of heritage intermixing with a sort of identity politics in Britain itself, which is not, of course, as sharply divisive or as aggressive, let's hope it doesn't become so, as India's. At times, we have seen conflicts over heritage and the right to shape public space in Britain, which pit very different values against one another, values that reflect different classes, or perhaps, as a Marxist would say, fractions of classes, generations and identity positions against one another. The most famous was the conflict over St Pancras in the 60s between campaigners like Betjeman uh, and modernists and classicists whom Betjeman and co saw as elitish and snobbish progressives who disdained the Victorian past that he loved. Prince Charles's famous broadside against the car bundles of the 1980s I think was something similar. A somewhat different identity conflict, I think, may be developing now with struggles over star architecture and the blingification of public space. The emerging battle over the identity of London, of course, is an example. Is it a plutocratic playground or is it bohemian? In some ways, these issues are similar to those in India, but in others, not. In India, heritage is often used to protect elite enclaves, whereas in the UK, heritage seems to be emerging as something of a bulwark against the rise of glittering towers for sale to the global plutocracy. Perhaps more similar to India, they're not exactly about heritage as a built environment, is the strange cult of Richard III in Leicester. Um, whatever the origins of this heritage event, it has become a way of advancing a town that feels hard done by in a London-centric UK, as well as promoting an English identity in a highly multiracial environment. So what are the lessons of India then? Well, that heritage is inevitably political. It raises questions about identity, social justice and cultural dominance. 
So as far as possible decisions, so as far as possible decisions over preservation and demolition need to be depoliticized through the use of experts. In India, I would say UNESCO plays this role rather well uh, and has been very useful in preserving important but neglected sites whose reservation whose restoration might otherwise arouse ire. But of course expertise has to be combined, has to be combined with wide consultation, or else we end up with experts of the era blithely demolishing the St. Pancrases of the time. But when confronting battles between experts, developers, and democracy, it's very clear that there are going to be no easy answers. Well done. Simon Thurley. Thank you. Well, as um, Daniel said right at the beginning, of course, people have always liked uh, going to old places, looking at old buildings. A few years ago, we uh, at English Heritage dug a, a, a hole in Stonehenge and we found uh, a Roman coin very neatly and deliberately placed uh, next door to one of the stones, evidence, I think, of Roman tourists going to have a look at the stones. <laughs> and of course, there's that wonderful poem, which many of you will know, an uh, Anglo-Saxon poem called The Ruin, uh, which describes uh, uh, the experience of an Anglo-Saxon visitor to the ruins of Bath. And he's clearly a tourist uh, uh, admiring the ruins. And I'm not going to give a, a, a comprehensive history of, uh, of tourism, but of course, the pilgrimage of the, religious, of the Middle Ages, whilst having a very strong religious motivation, uh, was, were also motivated by tourism, to go and see in Gasp and Gaul the extraordinary um, um, cathedrals and, and tombs. Um, and the history goes on through the early modern period with travellers coming across Europe to um, visit palaces and houses and write in their, their, their diaries what they had seen. But I think something very important starts to happen in the 16th century because people start to see that uh, buildings uh, that are becoming redundant don't automatically need to be demolished and replaced. Because all that tourism before was tourism that was taking place to buildings that were in use. But in the 16th century, at the Tower of London, the Tudor monarchs realized that the White Tower is redundant. It's functionally redundant. There is no use for it. And so what they decide to do is use it as a museum. And they display in it the armor from their um, medieval predecessors. So suddenly, you have a building that is preserved because it's important and open to the public who then go and visit it. In fact, the Tower of London is the first example in this country of a building that I see being a heritage uh, attraction. And there's, it's, there's quite a long time that passes then before the, the second really big important building which is open to the public in 1837, which is Hampton Court. It is a, a huge gesture, a massive change. Here is a building that is completely functionally redundant. The monarchy doesn't use it anymore. The monarchy doesn't need it. It's open to the public with all its furniture in place, all its paintings in place. It's not in use. It is an um, attraction. And so we have a, a different sort of tourism for the first time. We have people who are not going to see living buildings, buildings that are in use. They are going to visit redundant buildings. This um, is a show. This is not voyeurism, looking at a building that's in use. People are going for um, completely different reasons. And in 1913, and there's some very interesting Indian parallels which we won't go into here, but in 1913, uh, the government passes um, some legislation. It's, in fact, triggered by Lord Curzon, um, which sets out deliberately to form a national collection of great redundant buildings for the edification and the education of uh, British citizens. Uh, a government anxious about Americanization, a, gun a government anxious about national identity, about the loss of economic power just before the uh, First World War, triggers the, a frenzy of, of collecting. Government inspectors go out between 1913 and 1939 and collect hundreds and hundreds of castles and abbeys to represent the history of the nation. Now, as already has already been noted by a number of 
other people have spoken, uh, history is seen through the lens of the present, and those people who were collecting these monuments uh, in the interval period saw the two most important things about English history being the Reformation and parliamentary democracy. And so the buildings that are collected are the abbeys and churches that are ruined by Henry VIII uh, at the Reformation, and the castles and houses that are slighted during the Civil War. It's a collection to represent the most important parts of English history. So the state is deciding what is important in history and creating a collection to educate the public into those important things, Protestantism and parliamentary democracy. Now, of course, um, after the Second World War, the interests of those government inspectors, the official custodians of the official uh, heritage story, if you like, of the country, have wider interests. They start collecting um, abandoned medieval villages. They start collecting uh, 18th and 19th century blast furnaces. Eventually start collecting 20th century military buildings. And those buildings, monuments, collected by those inspectors, uh, authorised, every single one that was collected was authorised by a politician, by a Secretary of State, create the vast collection of over 800 monuments that are looked after by the state in England today. And you have to add to those, of course, 400 or so monuments that are looked after by the National Trust, a body set up by the government because it couldn't afford to also collect the country houses as well as all the monuments. And when you total up the people uh, who visit these places, the 11 million people who visit the monuments in the care of English heritage in England, and I don't know how many people in Scotland and Wales, but many millions more, plus the 13 million people who are visiting uh, the buildings of the National Trust, you're looking at a good 40 million or so uh, visits every year to these redundant buildings, buildings which have no use but which are presented to the public. And of course, if you were to add to that huge 40 million, the visitors who go to cathedrals, to historic towns, to country houses that are occupied by their owners, you are looking at the nation's favorite hobby. What are they seeing? And this is what uh, the big question is uh, this evening. Well, I think there is a distinction, and there is a big distinction, between uh, going to visit a historic town, York, uh, going to visit a cathedral that's in use, going to visit a country house that's lived in by its owners. These are living, breathing, working buildings. And on the other hand, visiting a building that is looked after by English Heritage, National Trust, or a local authority, when you are visiting a fossilized, monumentalized uh, building, uh, which has been presented for your benefit. And of course, this is uh, Robert's um, bugbear. This is where the tension arises, because the question is, what are you showing? What are you seeing? What is authentic? What is authenticity? Where is the boundary between fact and fantasy, between history a theme, and a theme park? For me, the crucial issue here is actually about redundancy, because it is redundancy that uh, causes uh, this problem. If you have a building that falls out of use and you want to keep it, somebody has to pay for it. And essentially, I think you have two choices. You can either reuse and recycle it, so you can turn an old bank that's very handsome on your high street into a, into a, um, into a restaurant or a church, um, as you see in uh, Bradford and Leeds, into a Hindu wedding venue. Uh, or the other choice is you can monumentalize it. You can turn it into a visitor attraction. And when you look at uh, our, our, I don't like the word heritage, but we're using it, we're banding it around, so I'm going to use it, our heritage in this sense, you start to look at tourism, the heritage industry uh, of Robert's uh, uh, definition, as part of the economic structure of protecting uh, the history of the nation. And arguably, without it, you don't have the raw materials of history. You do not have the evidence. And so, for me tonight, the question that uh, I'm interested in is does this 
economic imperative that I have uh, described justify what is done to the name to, to the buildings uh, in the name of heritage. Thank you very much.